Well, hello, Moon Valley. Listen, I'm very excited about today's message. You see, while I was preparing for my last message concerning worries and anxieties from chapter 4 of Philippians, I was really struck by the thought that I would love to preach through the entire book of Philippians as a series of messages. I spoke to Bob and he agreed, so over the course of the next year or so, I'll have the opportunity to teach a message every few months working our way through Philippians. And I haven't done something like this, teach through an entire book of the Bible, in years. So I'm looking forward to this. At the same time, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed, but mostly excited. And Philippians is such a great book. Paul, uh, God uses Paul to touch on a few themes in this letter that tell us how to build a better church. And as we go through this letter, we'll see Paul coming back time and again to those same themes over and over. Unity and love, joy and contentment. Along the way, we'll look at humility, and we'll even compare legalism and licentiousness to the liberty we find in the gospel of Christ. Before we get started on the message, though, there are some interesting things about Philippi and the church there that can give us some insight to this letter. Uh, to begin with, Paul founded the church in Philippi in the year 50 while on his second missionary journey. God called him to specifically start a church in Europe. Up to this point, all the churches were in Asia. And you can see Asia in yellow in this map while Europe is in red, and Philippi is in the center near the top, identified with blue lettering. And Philippi was an important city in the first century. About a hundred years earlier, the Romans granted Philippi the highest status possible for a non-Roman uh, city, the status of a Roman colony. Now this made Philippians Roman citizens, and being a Roman was important because this meant that the citizens of Philippi could purchase, own, and transfer property. They could also file lawsuits in Roman courts, and they were exempt from paying certain taxes. And they had due process rights if they were accused of crimes. And none of these things were available to the average non-citizen under Roman rule. As an important and strategic city of commerce on a major Roman highway, the Ignatian Way, Philippi was a mixture of races, cultures, and social classes, and this was reflected in the church's membership. These included uh, an upper-class businesswoman named Lydia, a demon-possessed slave girl who was delivered of her demons by Paul, and a middle-class jailer who became a believer when Paul was jailed for delivering that demon-possessed slave girl. And Lydia was Asian, the slave girl was Greek, and the jailer was Roman. All were apparently Gentiles, most likely with different religious backgrounds. So Philippi was a culturally, socially, religiously, and financially diverse city, and so was the church. So with all that in mind, let's dig into our first message and see what God wants to tell us about building a better church. Beginning in verse 1, we read, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Not going to spend too much time on these opening verses, but there are two things I want to point out to you real quick. First, Paul refers to himself and Timothy as bondservants of Jesus Christ. Now, this term means more than just a slave. The Greek word doulos carries the idea of subjection without the idea of bondage. And right now, you're probably saying to yourself, what? That makes no sense, Jeff. But it's true. Doulos means subjection without bondage. In other words, it's voluntarily placing yourself under the leadership or lordship of another. In this case, Jesus himself. You see, our Christian walk is a voluntary way of life. Every minute of every day, we can choose to follow God or not. We're not slaves in the common sense of the word. We have the choice of obeying or disobeying. And we'll pick this theme up in the future, but for now, I just want you to understand that our life as a bondservant is optional. 
God doesn't keep us captive in chains and force us to serve and obey him. It's something he allows us to choose to do. And second, the term saints isn't reserved for persons of exceptional holiness. That word designates all believers, every single one of us. Time and again, the Bible teaches us that if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you are a saint. Whether you've dedicated yourself to a life of exceptional holiness or perform miracles, to be a saint in the New Testament, all one has to do is believe in Jesus for eternal life. Here, look at 1 Corinthians uh, verses 1 and 2 as an example. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Here, Paul is addressing a letter to what is arguably the most messed up church in the world at that time. As Bob has pointed out several times in his Beyond Our Strength series on 2 Corinthians, the letters to the Corinthians were very difficult for Paul to write and very difficult for the Corinthian believers to read because he had to address problem after problem, issue after issue. In total, there were four letters that we know of that were sent to Corinth, all trying to correct the sin in their midst. And yet, Paul still called them saints. He said they were just as sanctified and just as much saints as all the other believers everywhere. The sin in their lives didn't stop them from being saints. They were saints in spite of their sin. And so it is with us. God calls us saints even though we don't always act holy. We might not even act holy very much at all. But simply because we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ for eternal life, God has separated us unto himself and calls us saints. So here in Philippians, Paul is addressing every believer at Philippi, and by extension, every believer here at Moon Valley Bible. Okay, so moving on, in verses 3 through 5, we read, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making request for you with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul really makes an effort to point out the fellowship of believers. And he actually starts this idea in verse 1, where he states this letter is from him and Timothy. You see, as an apostle and the actual author, he could have just said the letter was from him. He didn't have to include Timothy, but he did. In verse 2, he addresses the letter to the entire church at Philippi, not just the pastor or elders or leadership. And as we'll see in later messages, Paul mentions several members by name. And this idea of including everyone is not unique to Philippians. We find it in every letter Paul wrote to churches. The concept of fellowship was very important to Paul. You see, Paul recognized that Christianity and spreading the gospel is a shared experience. We're not called to be a one-man army, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ on our own. We are not lone wolves. God has called us to serve him together. In several New Testament passages, God refers to the body of Christ and describes individual Christians as different parts of that same body. When we are much more effective as the body, when we meet together, when we learn together, when we study together, when we rejoice together, when we comfort one another, when we share our lives with each other. And as the world sees us work together, they see Christ's love lived out in our lives, and this has an effect on the rest of the world. If Christians are in fellowship with each other, if we share our lives with each other, if we love each other, the rest of the world will notice. And that makes our job of bringing the gospel to a lost and dying world just a little easier. Hey, that's not something I made up. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples at the Last Supper? By this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. In the notes in the Nelson Study Bible for this verse, the editor said, Unbelievers recognize Jesus' disciples not by their doctrinal distinctiveness, 
nor by dramatic miracles, nor even by their love for the lost. They recognize his disciples by their deeds of love for one another. Jesus is saying that if the world doesn't see us love each other, if they don't see us enjoy each other's company, if they don't see us care for each other, then why in the world should they believe that we'll love them, enjoy their company, and care for them? And if we don't believe, I'm sorry, and if they don't believe we love, enjoy, and care for them, why should they listen to us when we try to tell them about the love of Jesus or our doctrinal beliefs? Our love for each other can be a tremendous sign to the rest of the world that we have the love of Jesus in us and that we can tell them how they can receive that love for, from him for themselves. I right, need a little more convincing. See that word fellowship in verse 5? The Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. It's a commercial term. And it refers to a joint partnership in a business venture in which all parties actively participate to ensure the success of the business. Paul is saying that the success of the church at Philippi, and by extension, Paul's success as a missionary, is due to the collaborative efforts of the Philippian Christians and Paul. Folks, there's no escaping it. God does not intend for us to grow as Christians or to spread the gospel by going it alone. We need other believers in our lives. It's God's plan for bringing life to the world. Now, this doesn't mean that we will always agree on everything, all the time, with absolutely no difference of opinion. You're not a bad Christian if you hold a different opinion than I do. I'm not a bad Christian if I hold a different opinion than Bob does. We're not called to be mindless robots, believing and acting in lockstep like the Borg in Star Trek. It means that we love each other. We respect each other. We recognize that the other person will, at times, see things differently than we do. But we continue to love one another. Look, anytime you put more than one person in the same room, eventually there will be a difference of opinion. But a difference of opinion doesn't mean you have to hate the other person or think less of them. Just because someone is different doesn't mean you give up on them and refuse to fellowship with them. I know this is in stark contrast to our current political climate. We see the opposite of this played out on social media. If you don't mercilessly and viciously attack someone who thinks differently than you do, you're doing it wrong. At least that's what our politicians and Facebook and Twitter flamethrowers would have you believe. But it's not biblical. God doesn't tell us to attack and denigrate a politician who is from the other political party. He doesn't tell us to belittle someone when they deviate in the slightest from our preferred way of thinking. And if he doesn't tell us to behave like this with non-believers, there's no way he'll ever convince me that this is how he wants us to treat believers who think differently than we do. Let me give you a real, word, uh, a real world illustration of this verse. Most of you know that I sit on the board of elders. And I love serving in that capacity. I love serving my Moon Valley family in this way, and I love serving on the board with the other elders. These are men that I love and respect as men, as Christians, and as spiritual leaders. And we discuss all aspects of running a modern church. We approve budgets and expenditures. We discuss policies and procedures. We decide positions of faith and belief. Anything and everything that concerns Moon Valley Bible, our congregation, and our spiritual life. And while I'm constantly amazed at how closely aligned we are on these important issues, we're not always in 100% agreement on everything. Sometimes we have different opinions. One elder wants to move in one direction. Another elder believes a different direction would be better. I've seen instances where one elder believes strongly that the that a particular course of action should be followed, while all the other elders believe the opposite. But do you know what I've never seen? Anger, strife, jealousy, bitterness, and argument. And do you know why? 
because love and respect permeates everything we do. Every decision is based on our love for our Moon Valley family and for each other. And if we can't resolve a particular issue in the moment, we usually table it for the time being and spend the next few days or weeks in prayer until we're able to reach a consensus on what we believe is the right thing to do. And that, my friends, is koinonia in action. We are committed to the success of Moon Valley Bible Church and our mission of bringing life to a lost and dying world, and we won't let a mere difference of opinion detract us from that mission. All right, well, let's continue in our passage. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And here we come to the key verse of the whole book, this concept of building a better church. God has begun a good work at Philippi, but the word you is plural, indicating the that the good work is being done within the entire church, all of the individuals who make up the church at Philippi, not just certain people. Remember, Paul sent this letter to the entire Philippian church, the whole congregation. God doesn't just deal with the leaders, the folks in ministry. He works among every single believer in a congregation. Remember the point Paul made earlier concerning fellowship? We're all called to spread the gospel and bring life to our community and the world. It's not just Bob's job as the pastor. It's not just the elder's job. It's not just the paid staff's job. No, God calls all of us to serve. It's the job of the entire congregation. And it's the entire congregation that God started this good work in, every single believer. Four separate times in verses 4 through 8, Paul uses the word all. It was true in Philippi, and it's true here in Moon Valley. God has started a good work in all of us, and he will continue this good work until the day Jesus returns. And now might be a good uh, time for us to look at our big idea for today's message. To build a better church, God must build a better me. Remember, this letter is addressed to all the Christians in Philippi and, by extension, to all the Christians here in Moon Valley. Moon Valley Bible Church isn't this nice building, no more than it was Mountain Sky Junior High or the old building on Greenway or, or Thunderbird High School. The church isn't a building, it's us. It's the congregation. No matter where we meet, whether it's a building we own or rent, whether it's a permanent location or temporary, Moon Valley Bible Church exists as a body of believers. And God has begun a good work in this body of believers, just like he began one in the body of believers at Philippi. And this good work is ongoing. It's making us better as individuals and ultimately as a church. Look at the phrasing Paul employs. Being confident of this, of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God has started a good work in us, but it's not yet completed. God is continuing to work with us. He's continuing to make us better, both as individuals and as a church. As I said a moment ago, it's ongoing. But this means we'll never be perfect this side of heaven. No matter how hard we try, no matter how much we want to be, neither Moon Valley Bible Church nor us as individuals will ever attain perfection here on earth. And I want you to fully grasp this concept for two reasons. One, if you're looking for a perfect church, keep walking. You won't find it here. Actually, you won't find it anywhere. And looking for perfection on earth will always disappoint, bitterly in most cases. Moon Valley Bible and the people who make up Moon Valley Bible are imperfect. We are. We will get it wrong sometimes. We may offend you at some point. We may neglect you at some point. We may fail you in some way or another. We don't want to, 
It's certainly not our intention, but since we're imperfect human beings, we will. We will do things wrong. I'm not making excuses. I'm being realistic. We are all sinners saved by grace, which means we're all imperfect human beings. Sometimes we fail others. Sometimes others fail us. It's a fact of life. But we don't have to let our failures or the failures of other believers destroy our Christian fellowship, our koinonia. With grace and love, we can prayerfully try to work things out. It's hard. It's difficult. It's not fun. It's uncomfortable. But it's what God has called us to do. It's what is necessary if we are to bring life to our world. And the second reason I want you to grasp this concept of an ongoing work of God in our lives is how we view ourselves in relation to other Christians. See, too many believers suffer from Christian imposter syndrome. And what is that, you ask? It's feeling like you're a fake, like everyone else is a better Christian than you are, like you're not a good enough Christian and you live in fear that everyone else will find out just how little of a Christian you really are. Christian author Sam uh, Albury defines it this way. Imposter syndrome is the haunting feeling that you can't really do what everyone expects you to be able to do. It assumes that any success you've experienced was an unrepeatable fluke. You're a fraud. At any moment now, everyone is going to realize that. He goes on to say, there's a similar feeling that easily creeps into our Christian lives as well. We walk into church on Sunday and look around. Everyone else looks as though they belong here. They seem to have the Christian life figured out, or so we think. But Christianity doesn't feel so natural to us. It feels far from second nature. And we can start to think, there's no point. This isn't me. I'm just trying to be someone I'm not. And Davis Wetherill, another Christian author, puts it this way. The constant feeling that you do not belong to your own community or that your accomplishments are illegitimate. It's the idea that you look around at everyone else and you think, they've got it all together. They live out this Christian life better than I do. They don't have the constant fear and worry that I live with. They don't struggle with the sins that I carry. And they can quote Bible verses till the sun goes down. I don't measure up. I'm not as good a Christian as they are. But I got news for you. You're wrong. You're not any better or any worse than anyone else here. We all struggle with fear and worry, and anxiety is a constant companion for some of us. Some may be able to quote more Bible verses than others, but that's not necessarily an indication of their spirituality. It could just mean they have a good memory. And for some, they memorized verses as a kid in Sunday school before they ever believed in Jesus for eternal life. And we all struggle with sin. You may struggle with addictions. Lies are told by Christians just like they're told by non-Christians. Perhaps you have a problem with your language. And trust me, you are not alone in that one, not by a long shot. The point is, God said he started a good work in us. He didn't say he finished it. As a matter of fact, he specifically told us he hasn't finished it. Nobody lives a perfect Christian life. Not pastors, not elders, not people who grew up in church, not people who went to Bible college, not even Christians who have been believers for 40 or 50 years or more. None of us live the perfect Christian life that we think everyone else does. And I believe that most, if not every Christian, experiences this feeling of Christian imposter syndrome at some point in their lives, even people we look up to as spiritual leaders. Now, about a year and a half ago, in December of 2019, the president of the Elder Board, Don Newhouse, asked if I would consider serving on the Elder Board. He told me that the current board had discussed and prayed over this for a while now, and they believed that they should ask for my consideration. And I gotta tell you, I was stunned. I think for the first time in my life, 
I actually experienced the sensation of my jaw hitting the floor. As I stated a little earlier in this message, I know every member of the board and I respect them greatly as men, Christians, and spiritual leaders. And now, here they were asking me to serve with them? You know what my first thought was? How have I fooled these men for so long? I kid you not. You can ask Don. I actually told him that. My first thought was that somehow, some way, I fooled these guys into thinking that I'm someone I'm not. I had such respect for these men that I never even considered the thought that I was in their league. There's no way I'm as worthy as they are to serve on this board. And my second thought was a quote from Psalm 51, where David says, uh, my sin is ever before me. And a quote from Isaiah 6, where Isaiah says, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. In the psalm, David is confessing his sin before God and seeking forgiveness. All I could think of was that I'm much too sinful to be an elder. In Isaiah, God has shown him a vision of the Father on the throne, and Isaiah realizes he's not worthy to see this. And all I could think of is, I'm not worthy to serve with these men. And that's how I felt. All I could think of was my sin and that I'm not worthy of this calling. And I even told Don as much. We talked for a while, and I finally agreed to pray about it, but I was by no means certain that I would say yes. Not because I didn't want to, but because I didn't believe I belonged there. I didn't believe I was worthy, and any minute now, everyone's going to see this and call me out on my fake Christianity that's just not good enough for the elder board. But as I prayed over the next several days, I remembered something. I remember that none of us are worthy of serving God. Pastors aren't worthy of their calling. Bible college professors aren't worthy of their calling. Worship leaders aren't worthy of their calling. Youth leaders aren't worthy of their calling. And elders aren't worthy of their calling. We're all sinners. We all have things we want to hide from the rest of the world, but we can't hide them from God. God knows all about us, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And yet, in spite of our sinfulness, in spite of everything we keep hidden from the rest of the world, God still asks us to serve him. He wants us to serve him. So after several days, I called Don and formally accepted the offer to serve my Moon Valley family on the elder board. A month later, I was voted in. And although I still know I'm not worthy to serve you or our God in this capacity, I love being on the board. I find joy in serving in this capacity. So don't let this idea that you're an imposter of a Christian rob you of your joy. Don't let it fill you with dread that others will find out you're a fake because you're not. If you've trusted in Jesus for eternal life, you are a Christian, the same as everyone else. You succeed at some areas of your Christian life and you fail at others, just like the rest of us. But God stated that he has already begun a good work in you, and he promised that he will complete it. God does not just start a work in us, he finishes what he starts. In our day-to-day -day lives, we may not see the growth, but it's there. We are growing little by little, bit by bit. We can't see it because we're looking at yesterday compared to today, and that's not enough time to see growth. But I can tell you I am not the same man I was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. For example, in my 20s, I was much more judgmental and argumentative than I am today. Oh, I was quick to point out the sin in others, not so quick to admit to my own. On the contrary, I was quick to offer up excuses for my own sin. And I'm not perfect now, far from it. But I am farther along in my Christian walk today in my 50s than I was 30 years ago in my 20s. And you may not notice changes from one day or week to the next, but you will notice changes over time. And these changes that God is making in us, this good work that he started in us, is how he makes Moon Valley Bible Church better. By continuing his good work in us individually, 
he's continuing his good work in Moon Valley Bible corporately because we are the church. To build a better church, God must build a better me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, the things you have to teach us about our fellowship with each other. We pray that we would remember that when differences of opinion come up between us. We thank you, Father, for the good work that you've started in us, how you're going to make us better as time goes on, and how you're going to make Moon Valley Bible Church better as time goes on. We pray for all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.